currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from federaljack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition. It is November 26th, 2012 couple days after Thanksgiving, four days after the 49th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And I originally was uh, going to do something else tonight, but because of the reaction I got to um, my broadcast the day before, Wednesday night, the 21st, and because of the reaction I got to the 12-hour Kennedy assassination special that we aired uh, on Thanksgiving from noon to midnight, I wanted to air some extra stuff that I was not able to fit in there. Because believe me, there's a, a ton more uh, info and audio and stuff that I didn't get a chance to present uh, on either of those two days. Because just there, on, uh, honestly, 24 hours of solid broadcasting about this wouldn't be enough time to get it all out there. So uh, I had gotten, uh, I have received, I listened to my, my English, God, that's horrible. I, you could tell I went to public high school. Um, I received a bunch of emails as well. Uh, Jimmy did, and uh, I know Ryan got an email, and a couple of the other hosts, as well as we got calls on the uh, call-in line where, uh, you know, and by the way, people, we do have a call-in line. Um, I'll get the number in a second because I don't remember off the top of my head, and I'll give it to you. But you can call in and leave comments and stuff. But people were calling in about the uh, the JFK special, and they were emailing and stuff. And uh, they were really – even comments on Facebook, and they were just uh, super excited that somebody out there had donated you know, 12 hours of time to covering it because apparently it's almost like the JFK assassination wasn't even a blip on the radar this year. You know, I know it fell on Thanksgiving and I kind of had a feeling that that was going to happen. And a lot of people, uh, in the media, no matter what you want to call it, the alternative media, if you want to call it, you know, even the mainstream media, nobody really covered the assassination. It was kind of poo pooed under the rug. Everything was happy Thanksgiving and eat your Turkey and be happy. And, there might have been mention of JFK's assassination here or there, but it really was not covered anywhere, any form. And there was such a um, an over, you know, like an overpouring of uh, or whatever you want to call it of uh, uh, you know thanks for us covering it. I was like, well, I guess I'll just give it another two hours because I do have a ton of other stuff that I had wanted to air, and I just didn't have enough time. So. I figured that I would uh, do a you know a part two to last Wednesday's episode, which is what today will be, and I'm going to play a ton 
uh, of audio for you. That's it's more evidence. You're going to hear from witnesses that are now long dead. In fact, you're going to hear. I had mentioned Lee Bowers uh, uh, last Wednesday. I'm going to play his actual uh, interview. You're going to get to hear from Lee Bowers now. Again, he's dead, so this is stuff that you can't. It's 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 not easy. Let's say to get your hands on it. Now, if you go to uh, YouTube. I'm going to give you the name of the YouTube channel. If you're a YouTube person at all, I'm going to give you the name of the YouTube channel where you can go check out uh, this, a lot of the audio that I'm going to play for you guys, but a, a, a ton more stuff. Uh, whoever does it, I, the guy's never asked me to promote him or anything like that. I'm just doing this because uh, I've been using this guy's YouTube channel for a long time, a few years at least, and he's got a lot of good clips up there. So check it out. The title of the YouTube channel is JFK63 conspiracy all one word so it's j f k six three the numbers six three so j f k the numbers six three and then conspiracy all together as one word and that's the channel and you'll see if this guy's got a ton of different video clips up there stuff from you know maybe older documentaries that are you know gone you know if they're not on google video or youtube anymore Sometimes things get taken down. Sometimes the channel that, that hosted this video, and maybe it was only one or two copies of, maybe the channel got taken down for something else. So a lot of this uh, quality stuff, this older information, goes away. And then newer researchers only know what little video snippets they see on uh, YouTube or if they've read some books, which is – that will give you more information. But some of these uh, – some of this stuff is is witness testimony that – I mean, most of these people are dead, so good luck getting it. Now, either like Lee Bowers, they died under suspicious circumstances, or in other cases, uh, they just died because they're really old. Uh, either way. So first thing I want to get into, because I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, you know, Time is limited. So I, I want to get into uh, George DeMorne Shield. And you're going to hear – first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to play this clip – explaining who George DeMore and Shield was, and you're going to hear the person in it talk about uh, his death. And then I'm going to play a snippet of my, my first interview uh, with Judith Baker where she brings up George DeMore and Shield and Roger Craig, who was a, a police officer. He was a deputy sheriff. So but I, I want to play this for you because it's, um, I, I think it's, it, it's interesting. Wait till you hear – I've brought up DeMore and Shield before. I've talked about how um, they say he committed suicide. And he didn't commit suicide. Here, check this out. Living in Dallas, Oswald was befriended by Russian-born George DeMorenshield. And by the way, yes, that is Bill O'Reilly you hear. This is back in his early days on uh, whatever the hell that show was. I forget. He mentions the name of it. The person that put this video together cut this little snippet out so you can understand who DeMorenshield was. But I thought I'd pause it and let you know that, yes, that's Bill O'Reilly. Mr. Sellout himself. Just... I just think it's funny how there are certain things now, he, if you talk to him about the JFK assassination, he'd be like, oh, I've researched it, there's no evidence, blah, 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 blah. Really? What about this, Bill? What about this? Investigators determined he was a contract agent for the CIA in Central America and the Caribbean. In 1977, moments before he was to be interviewed by House investigators, DeMorenshield blew his brains out with a 20-gauge shotgun. House investigators believe he was a crucial link between the CIA and Lee Harvey Oswald. There is no question that the sealed JFK files are extremely embarrassing for the CIA. House investigators have told Inside Edition that the agency did not fully cooperate in their investigation and that the CIA had final say in the report that the House Assassinations Committee made public. Thus, the public report makes no mention of the CIA's links with Lee Harvey Oswald. But the secret documents are another story. One interesting sidelight, the movie JFK was partially based on Jim Garrison's investigation in New Orleans. Well, House investigators uncovered evidence that the CIA planted nine agents inside the Garrison investigation to feed him false information and to report back to Langley on what Garrison was finding out. What do you think about 
George DeMorne Schultz. Is there some accurate connection with uh, the intelligence community? Oh, yeah. George DeMorne Schultz was a spy for a lot of different people over the years. He was a quite remarkable man. They picked him up for, they thought he was attempting to assassinate the Marshal Tito. He went into Guatemala, he went into the impenetrable jungles of Guatemala. He and his wife, he said, and they emerged on the very day that the Bay of Pigs troops left Guatemala City. He arrived in Guatemala City. He worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. He was the so baby. He must have known uh, E. Howard Huff, certainly, in those days. Well, I presume he probably did, but in any event, he was the babysitter for Lee Harvey Oswald for the CIA. And uh, he, he was about to be called as a witness before the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and he died the day before he was supposed to call. I went down there for the coroner's inquest. It was quite interesting because the district attorney... What happened was this. The marshal was staying at a home where his daughter lived. His daughter was staying with a very wealthy woman in Florida. And this woman, it's kind of like a Columbo movie. And this is before the days when people had the videotape recorders. And she went out, this woman, uh, to uh, play a, mo a bridge tournament. Uh, but she wanted to watch, she wanted to hear, have a record made of some soap opera. So she said to her domestic worker, here's an audio tape recorder. Just put it on and record the uh, the sound of this television uh, soap opera and so the tape recorder was playing and then you hear George you hear the bullet the, the, the shotgun explode the shot that killed uh, George Marshall they claimed he committed suicide but if you listen to the tape you hear this you hear a little noise you hear silence and, you hear, and then you hear beep 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 a little more noise and then you hear the shot the beep, 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 beep was a security system on medium mode. One mode is if, uh, if it's on fully armed, if anyone opens a door or window, a siren goes off and the police are notified. On another mode, it's off entirely. But on the medium mode, it goes beep, 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 beep to show that someone has opened the door and come into the house. Just before the marshal was shot, that's what happened. And I talked to the district attorney when I listened to that tape. I was down there just before the coroner's inquest, and I said, does that sound like someone came in the house? He said, we're not going to go into that. And I said, why? Well, I said, do you understand why this is bigger than all of us? We have to do what we have to do. I said, I don't understand that. And he said, well, listen, you know, you can't speak at the coroner's inquest. You're just going to be a spectator. I said, I don't know that. And so he played the tape and told the, the coroner's jury, uh, a cross section of the folks in the area that uh, this was a suicide, etc. And this woman on the car in his jury said, That beep, 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 that sounds like my security system. That means somebody apparently went into the house. He said, We're not going into that. And so they ruled that it was a suicide. That was into that. But I think that's a very serious question so as to what he was murdered. And then here's my here's an audio snippet of when I was talking to Judith Baker about this. This is from the first time I interviewed her, and she brought up George Demore and Shields' death and what you just heard. And uh, she brings up Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig. Some of the stuff you know that you've gone through, well, not not seen it, but you know, read about it and, and researched it, and it's just incredible. And it it lines up with everything else that all the anybody else that you know was involved with. Oh, like Roger Craig. About. Poor Roger Craig's body. If you look at his autopsy, he's got scars from head to foot. The poor man, you know. And and I talked to Roger Craig's nephew, and he, th there's stuff that has come out that Roger Craig's nephew has told me that he, that people don't realize. Roger Craig, you know, they say he shot himself with a shotgun, and he had all these revolvers handy, right? Okay, the shotgun is a clue. You have George and Warren Schultz being shot with a shotgun. Okay. And you've heard about the beep, 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 haven't you? The beep, beep, beep? Okay. No. What is that? Well, what it is is they say that George and Warren Schultz uh, killed himself, you know, just before, just Yeah, just before he was supposed to he, testify to Congress, right? Uh, to Gaten Fonzie. Gaten Fonzie. See, I, 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 you know, I've got too much in my head. It was Gaten Fonzie coming in four hours to interview him. And uh, he had thought of this card, and suddenly he's dead. Fonzie being an honest HSCA investigator. Uh, but when you hear the tape and uh, that they had, they always talk about this tape they had, that you can hear the gunshot on, proving what time it happened, that nobody was there, blah, blah. And in the background, you hear it beep, 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 beep. You know what that was? It's the intrusion alarm, meaning that somebody had come in through the, you know. So they actually caught the alarm going off. Yes. 
Yes. And they had the balls to say, dude, he, he just shot himself. Yes. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yep. You can look that up on the internet. Oh, I'm, now I'm going to go look that up because I didn't know about that. I knew George Mornshield had supposedly shot himself. Yeah, well, if you're going to look it up, you're going to Google, you know, Mornshield, you know, so that. And, or. and that's the clip I just played. And what's interesting is there is uh, – I've seen evidence that the FBI had uh, been monitoring DeMorne Shield too. And uh, I know that the, the – like you heard the original story where they had been recording the uh, the soap opera or whatever it was. Uh, and, and that's why they didn't know it was it, – that would make more sense as to why it was going on in there. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if the FBI was – uh, did in fact have his place bugged because you know the FBI is the Federal Bureau of Intimidation, and when you research a lot of these murders of uh, witnesses to a lot of these different things, whether it be uh, the JFK assassination, RFK's assassination, whatever, a lot of times you'll find that people involved were FBI agents. They themselves were the murderer. Now, Roger Craig, if I remember correctly, was one of the first guys on the scene there. He was one of the first police officers on the scene. And I know a lot of, you know, just like anything else, just like with the guy, uh, Terrence Yakey, with the Oklahoma City bombing, you have a, an officer who upholds their duty uh, and, you know, usually is one of the first people on the scene, right? And you, they, they later on commit suicide and find them uh, tortured. Roger Craig had bruises and signs of torture all over him. Same thing with Terrence Yakey. This is not something new, by the way. I mean, this happened in when he disappeared in the 60s and Yankee was, Oklahoma was in the 90s. So 30-year difference and they're still doing the same techniques. You think, it's a, you, you think it's a coincidence that both of these police officers were found uh, tortured to death, basically, but they committed suicide? And it's always a, they committed suicide. You just heard two separate people talking about how there's an audio recording of the beep, 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 which is the alarm system in DeMoran Shield's house. And even the lady in the court, you heard her, you heard the, the part about the lady in the court that said, hey, you know, on the jury, well, that sounds like my alarm system. We're not going there. Well, why not? This guy just killed himself. Yep. It's all clean cut. So is there really justice? Are you being told the truth then? I mean, if they're, if they're patch packaging this thing up, by definition, there has to be a conspiracy then, right, to cover it up. So if there's a conspiracy to cover it up, then there must be a conspiracy to have pulled it off. Why else would you cover it up? It was just some crazy lone gunman that was pissed off at Kennedy. Why would you need such a, a massively large, you know, conspiracy? I mean, it, it, there is no other term for it. It is what it is. That's why they always have to keep... Um, Oswald as a lone gunman. See, with 9-11, they use the same kind of playbook. But if you notice, it's not a lone gunman. It's a lone group. Because now this group, you can always add new members to the group. So it's an ongoing thing. And if something is uncovered along the way, because 9-11 was such a big operation, if something is uncovered along the way, it's easier to, to play it off or write it off or do whatever you got to do to distance yourself from it. Because they're, 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 it's a group of people. So there's a, there's, more, there's a way to muddy the water and confuse stuff. You can still say the term, you know, it can be argued that, they, yeah, I guess technically it is a conspiracy. Even Cass Sunstein has admitted that the government's own story is technically a conspiracy theory. Because it's 19 guys with Bin Laden conspiring in a cave with a laptop to take, you know, to take out the, these targets in New York and Washington, right? So... You can get mired down in the argument with that, and that's okay because the C word can, can, can come up, and it can get thrown back and forth, and you see how things are with 9-11 truth now. Whereas with the Kennedy assassination, you cannot even have a conspiracy to go with the official story because perhaps for whatever reason – Back then, they went with that story. Now, obviously, they've probably, if you look, it's like they've learned from the Kennedy assassination. So when they pulled 9-11 off, they tweaked it a little bit to make it a little easier to cover things up with 9-11. But you can see back then, they went with the one lone guy, the bad guy, the one lone nut. And if you even have somebody driving him to the gas station to get a, you know, 
uh, some gas to, to fill up his car, you know, six months ahead of time, there had to have been a conspiracy. That's why you have people attacking Judith Baker and saying her story, there's no way, blah, 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 blah. Because her story exposes a, a, a large part of this, quote unquote, conspiracy. Too often that word is thrown around and used. You know, all the time people will say, oh, well, it's not a conspiracy, but it's real. Well, no, see, you're misusing the word. You're getting people to think that the term conspiracy actually means that it's fake or that it's UFOs or ghosts and goblins and reptilians from the fourth dimension and all this other stuff. No, that's not what it means at all. The definition of conspiracy is two or more people getting together to do something bad. I'm sure a bunch of you have heard about this teacher scandal where these teachers got uh, arrested. This one dude got arrested, and I'm, some, I'm, I, I'm assuming it said in the article that they were, get, they were charging some of the other teachers that took the test, so I, I'm, I, I'm assuming they got arrested as well. But uh, the guy that was doing this, he was running a, a thing where teachers could, he, you know, he would send in fake people and had make fake IDs and sending them in to take these tests for these teachers who couldn't pass the test on their own, but they wanted to get a teaching job, right? So I'm, this has been out in the, the media now for a couple of days. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Do you know what the guy's being charged with? Hmm? He's got over 50 counts of what pending against him? 50 counts of dun, 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 conspiracy. So if he's got 50 counts of dun, 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 conspiracy against him, then why is it hard for you to accept that conspiracy is an actual real charge? It's not talking about UFOs or craziness. It's wordplay. People get played. And it's, it's, it's been, that's happened for a long time because you need to muddy the water. That way they can attack you and call you a conspiracy theorist. And, you know, I mean, it, it's all labels, right? It's to marginalize people. And Tim has a, a promo here in the network about conspiracy theory. And he says in there, you know, it's a magic phrase. It is. Because you can be like, you know, you got together with this guy to do this to us, and that's wrong. And they'll go, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. And then you have the media jumping on it. And because the public at large has been conditioned to it, you hear the term conspiracy theory. And well, not, not everybody now. More people are starting to wake up. But still, the, 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 the people that aren't awake will say, we'll hear the term conspiracy theory. And they instantly oh, oh, point fingers and laugh. Yet, here you have a real-life case where this guy did something bad, this teacher guy, right, who, who was forging these IDs and stuff and for the fake, you know, sending people to go take these tests. He's getting charged with conspiracy. All right, when we get back, more JFK audio clips, more evidence. You're going to hear from Lee Bowers. All right, I mentioned Lee Bowers, and I played some audio from him last Wednesday, the 21st talking about his death and how he he had come back. He'd been missing for like a day and a half. He came back and he was missing a finger. And then uh, uh, he, you know, he was in a mysterious single car accident shortly after that. Well, uh, in uh, within a, and I'm not sure, I, I don't exactly remember what year it is. We'll, we'll say but sometime it was between like 63 and 66, because I think he was dead by 66, if I remember correctly. So we'll say between 63 and 66 sometime. Uh, Mark Lane uh, interviewed Lee Bowers. And so people get a little bit of reference to who he is. Uh, Bowers was in a 14-foot tower inside the railroad yard behind the picket fence area. So he would have been behind the picket fence. So he would have seen the guys standing behind the picket fence taking the shot. And uh, when he was the interview you're going to hear with Mark Lane, he describes three cars which came into the parking lot shortly before the assassination. And he tells Lane about two men who were near the picket fence and describes something that happened there. Uh, and it, it, he says something, I remember in the video, he says something got my attention, a flash of light or smoke. And then he describes sounds of you know gunfire. And uh, you know, this, again, he he's dead, so you're it's hard to hear this again. That's why I'm glad I was able to find the full... It's hard to find some of the testimony. It's why, again, the YouTube channel I mentioned, I'll give him a shout-out again. All one word, JFK, the number 63, conspiracy. So JFK, 63, conspiracy. Check him out on YouTube. There's a ton of great stuff there. And 
you, you know, it's it's not easy. Sometimes this stuff gets scrubbed for whatever reason. Again, people have it uploaded to a channel, and the channel gets hit for some other reason, and boom, it goes away. So if you can, rip this, because this is some uh, pretty impressive information. This is Lee Bowers Jr. being interviewed by Mark Lane. Check this out. Incorporated, which is a real estate land development company. And where were you employed on November 22nd, 1963? At that time, I was employed as a tower operator for the Union Terminal Company. And where were you at about 12.30 that day? I was at the um, south end of the uh, terminal, of the tower building, uh, rather, looking down toward the terminal and observing the motorcade, as was everyone else in the area. Could you tell us what you heard and what you saw from about 12 noon until the time that the shots were fired? Well, for some time that morning, since uh, perhaps 10 o'clock in the morning, we had had the area pretty well sealed off, and uh, the policemen had been uh, stationed on the triple underpass as well as other strategic corners in the area. Uh, so that there was very little traffic moving into this area at this time. This is a dead end area which is used primarily for parking. Uh, after 11 or 11.30 there was practically no movement in the area whatsoever. Uh, however, about uh, 12.10, give or take five minutes, there was a car which entered the area and probed around for some time. Uh, this car was a 59 Oldsmobile station wagon with a out-of-state uh, license. It uh, was muddy as if it had just come in off of the road from some area where it was a red sandy area. Uh, it uh, was occupied by one male who spent uh, three or four minutes in the area uh, looking it over and then, uh, as he found out, left by the entrance, which is the only way in and out of the area at that time. Uh, not uh, too long after that, perhaps uh, five or six minutes, a car of a totally different description, also occupied by one male, entered the area. Now, this man uh, performed a similar action, and he toured down around the area, probing to examine the exits, and uh, seemed at uh, one or more occasions to have a mic or something resembling uh, such an instrument up to his face. Just a few moments after that, um, the third car uh, came into the area, and these were the only three cars that uh, entered this area during this uh, specific period. The third car was a 61 or 2 Chevrolet. Uh, this car was uh, muddy all the way up to the windows as if it had just come in off the road. It had an out-of-state license of the, identical to the first car of the series. And it also had political stickers on it, which were not only for the same uh, candidate, but were identical in nature and color, uh, so that they appeared to have been from the same group. This also, this car was occupied by uh, one male uh, who spent a little bit more time in the area than the others and I uh, probed down by the side of the tower where I was located. Uh, I could not state that these cars left the area entirely because after they got back onto the extension of Elm Street in front of the school depository building, they were lost to my vision so that uh, they could have remained uh, very close by. Immediately after the shots were fired, uh, of course, was... Uh, mass confusion, to put it mildly, uh, but the area was immediately sealed off by, uh, I would say, at least 50 police within three to five minutes. Um, the first one to appear on the scene, other than those who, of course, who were standing around, uh, including two on top of the triple underpass, was one who rode a motorcycle up the incline coming up from the lower portion of Elm Street. And he rode perhaps two-thirds of the way up or more before he deserted his uh, motorcycle. Uh, at the time of the shooting, uh, in the vicinity of where the two men I've described were, there was a flash of light or an, there was something which occurred which caught my eye. 
in this immediate area on the embankment. And what this was, I could not say at that time, and at this time I could not uh, identify it other than there was some unusual occurrence, a flash of light or smoke or, or something, uh, which uh, caused me to feel like something out of the ordinary had occurred there. In reading your testimony, Mr. Powers, it uh, appears that just as you were about to make that statement, you were interrupted in the middle of the sentence by the commission counsel, who then went into another area. Uh, well, um, well, that's that's correct. Um, I was there only to tell them what they asked, and uh, so that when they seemed to want to cut off the conversation, I felt like that was, uh, as far as I was concerned, that was the end of it. Mr. Barrows, how many shots did you hear? There were three shots, and these were spaced uh, with one shot, then a pause, and then two shots in very close order, such as perhaps... Uh, almost on top of each other while there was some pause between the first and the second shots. Did you tell that to the Dallas police? Uh, yes, I, I told this to the police and then uh, also told it to the uh, FBI and also I had a discussion uh, two or three days later with them concerning this and uh, they uh, made no comment um, other than the fact that uh, when I stated I felt like the second and third shots could not have been fired from the same rifle, uh, they um, reminded me that I wasn't an expert and uh, I had to agree. It says three months after our interview, Lee Bowers was killed in an accident. So three months after that interview, three months after that interview, that what you just heard, he was killed in his single car accident, which you'll find that happens a lot. Interesting. Hmm. Hallmark sign of getting rid of somebody that knew too much. You're a witness. You stand in the way. And if you really, <clears throat> if you really want to look into this, you want to see how many people died. Uh, again, I talked about the article. I have a copy of it up on federaljack.com uh, from Penn Jones Jr., and uh, he wrote a, an article about all the the people that died, and he's got a list of uh, all the you know a lot of the people. This was up to the, that period. I can only imagine what it is now if you went back. But it, it, there's a lot of people that after the assassination started showing up dead for various reasons under mysterious circumstances, which happens quite often. Okay, next up, more witness testimony. James L. Simmons. James L. Simmons stood atop the triple overpass with fellow workers S.M. Holland, who I'm going to play next hour. Uh, you're going to hear his testimony. And Richard C. Dodd. In this interview with Mark Lane, Mr. Simmons described seeing a, quote, puff of smoke coming from the picket fence area. And he was never called to testify to the Warren Commission, even though he spoke to the FBI. Just more witness testimony for those that don't believe that there was any gunman on the grassy knoll, they think it's a joke. Listen to the people that were there. We are in Mesquite, Texas, in the home of James Leon Simmons, a car inspector for the Union Terminal Railroad. Mr. Simmons, how long have you been employed by the Union Terminal? I've been employed by the Union Terminal 11 years. Were you a witness to the assassination of President Kennedy? Yes. I was standing on the Elm Street overpass at the time of the assassination. Were you there alone or with others? Uh, there was a group of employees from the Union Terminal at the time and uh, two Dallas policemen. What did you see and what did you hear? As the presidential limousine was rounding the curve on Elm Street, there was a loud explosion. At the time, I didn't know what it was, but it sounded like a loud firecracker or a gunshot and it sounded like it came from the left and in front of us towards the wooden fence and there was a puff of smoke that came underneath the trees on the embankment where was the puff of smoke mr simmons in relation to the wooden fence it was right directly in front of the wooden fence i show you a picture published by the Warren Commission as Commission Exhibit Number 2215, which is a view of the triple underpass area. 
ask you if you'd be good enough to mark with this pen with an X the area where you thought the shots came from, where you saw the smoke. And it was this area here. And he marked the area, by the way. Pause it for a second. He marked the area uh, right behind the wooden fence by the so-called grassy knoll. Shot. You saw the smoke. What did you do? I was talking with the patrolman Foster at the time. And as soon as we heard the shots, we ran around to the wooden fence. And when we got there, there was no one there. But there was footprints in the mud around the fence, and there was footprints on the wooden two before railing on the fence. Were you questioned by the Dallas police on that day? Yes, I was. Did you give your name to the Dallas police? Yes, I did. Did you tell them what you just told me? Yes, I did. Were you subsequently questioned by agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation? About... A month later, I was questioned by the FBI. Did you tell them what you told me and what you told the Dallas police? Uh, yes, I did. Were you ever called as a witness by the Warren Commission? No, sir, I wasn't. This is the Warren Commission report. The back of it has an index of every person who was referred to by the commission. Is your name present there? No, sir, it is. Do you think it's rather curious that you had such a fine view of the whole Dealey Plaza area and you were among those who saw smoke coming from evidently behind the fence and yet you were not called by the commission as a witness? Well, I always thought it peculiar, but I thought that's the way they did business. <laughs> As I said before, even if you look at a situation uh, like 9-11 or the JFK assassination, you take the incident at face value, look at the response to the incident, and usually that's very telling. And every time, 9-11, JFK, RFK, MLK, the BP oil spill, it does not matter what it is, there's always a cover-up. Every time. Every time. There's always a there's always a push to uh, go out there and and shut the witnesses up. Always, 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 always. You never, ever, 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 ever see something like this go down. And there's not this huge cover up to to deal with what happened. Now, if there was nothing nefarious going on to begin with, then why the need for the cover up? Well, because the nation can't handle it. That's garbage, and I don't want to hear that, okay? I do not want to hear that. Out of one side of the mouth, they'll tell us that the nation couldn't handle it, and then out of the other side of the mouth, they'll tell us that, well, we were ready for this, and, you know, we're strong, we're America, we can get through whatever, but then, you know, but we can't know the truth about anything because to know the truth, we're just too retarded for that. We're, not, we're strong enough to get through something like 9-11, but we're not strong enough to know the truth about it. Does that make any sense to you? Same thing with the JFK assassination. Well, it's national security. From what? It, what do you have to hide? Well, you know, we don't want to start things up with Russia. Oh, get out of here, please, with that garbage. They don't want any of those files released because if they release those files, you'll see things like the weaponized cancer research or LBJ's involvement and Hoover's involvement and other stuff. People like Clint Murkison. You'll see all these names pop up. You'll see all of this. So they can't have that. They can't have that kind of stuff out there. Why did the last three pieces of the Guilty Men get removed from the History Channel? Go to History.com. Go to their store and look up The Men Who Killed Kennedy. It'll tell you it's a six-part series. Go on Netflix. Look up The Men Who Killed Kennedy. It'll tell you it's a six-part series from the History Channel, if it's still on Netflix. Go look it up. The Men Who Killed Kennedy. We aired the audio the other day. You can see Part 7, Part 8, and Part 9 on YouTube. There's still a couple copies of them out there. Go check it out. Why would the History Channel have that stuff banned? 
Oh, because they talked about people like Clint Murkison and Hoover and LBJ and Judith and the, can the weaponized cancer. They can't have that out there. And anybody who's interested, speaking of weaponized cancer, and Judith mentioned this actually in one of the interviews I did with her. I asked her if uh, she thought that they took out Bob Marley with weaponized cancer, and she agreed they did. They gave him a pair of boots, and in the boots was a uh, like a wire, and this wire had this uh, whatever that was tipped with it. Now, I've also heard that, and Judith thinks that they also would have had to have... Um, the wire might have been a way to, you know, get him to have the infection to force him to go in for the medical treatment, which he then got injections, and she thinks that that might be how they uh, delivered it. And that could be, too. Um, and I'm, I'm going from memory, but it's basically about what she said about how they did it. But, again, and you could – that's a whole side subject of why they killed Marley. But, again, that's something else. And when someone first approached me with that years ago, I thought they were full of crap. But if you go look it up, the CIA took him out. I'm not kidding. And it's because he was going to unify uh, Jamaica, and they, you can't have that. When you're trying to run drugs and you're trying to control things, you have to have division. You can't have unity. Basically why they took him out. I mean, there's more to it, but um, yeah. So anyway, uh, the, I got a little sidetracked. Sorry about that. But the weaponized cancer thing, uh, all that stuff, they don't want you to know about that because look where that leads you to. Okay, look, look where that leads you to. Can you imagine if you took Judith, if you saw – Part eight, the love affair of the men who killed Kennedy, right? And you saw that, and you went, "Oh, really? This, uh, this is crap. I'm going to prove this wrong." Right? You start to go research it. You, you, oh, she's got a book. Well, all right, I'm going to see your book, and you read her book, and you find out that there's another book that goes along with it, Doctor Mary's Monkey. So you grab Doctor Mary's Monkey. Right? You start thumbing through Ed Haslam's book, great book, and uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm getting Ed back on the show soon. Uh, great author. Check his book out, Dr. Mary's Monkey. So you're thumbing through Ed's book, right? And you go, oh, well, this, this backs up uh, what Judith says. And then you find out there's people like Jim Mars who, oh, wow, well, yeah, he vouches for Judith. Okay. And, and when you research it, well, what she said is true. And she's got this as evidence and she's got that. Oh. So then if you start to take her serious, then look where it leads you to me asking her, Did you, do you think that they, the CIA took out Bob Marley? Yeah. And people can laugh at her and make fun of her for saying that or make fun of me for asking it, but go look it up. Do the research. I mean, history is truly stranger than fiction, ladies and gentlemen. It really is. And when it comes to the JFK assassination, there are so many things that are connected. That's why I wanted to play that audio from uh, Fletcher Prouty. The stuff I played, uh, if you listened on uh, Thursday, or was it Thursday? Uh, yeah, Thursday on Thanksgiving uh, when we played the JFK thing. One of the things I played, I think it was hour 10, if I remember correctly, was this uh, speech by, um, uh, what's his name, Prouty. And uh, it was not really a speech, it was really an interview, but it was his, him talking about uh, the Bay of Pigs in Vietnam. And it, it, which is, if you read his book, JFK, it, I urge you to go get his book, two books, because Colonel Prouty's dead. Uh, go get his two books, JFK, and then there's a little bit of a subtitle that's kind of long, so just look up Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, JFK book, and it'll come up. And his other book is The Secret Team. And when you read those two books, you'll understand this, the talk that he did. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to air it again uh, soon for everybody because I, th I think it's pretty cool that I, uh, you know, Colonel Prouty can come back to the airwaves from uh, beyond the grave to still uh, – uh, impart his knowledge out onto the masses. So I'm going to, and this one's really important, so I'm going to play it again because it kind of sums up his books. But you need to actually go get the books to, you know, understand a more in depth, um, or, or understand it more in depth, I should say, as to what he's talking about. But he talks about the Bay of Pigs, he talks about all that. And that's one of the reasons I played that, because all this stuff ties together. The JFK assassination, there's so much more to it than some crazy guy shot him from behind three times with a crappy rifle. It's not that simple, especially considering the head wound came from the front, right? The kill shot, right into the front of the noodle. And they say that came from behind. You know, Oswald would have had him been hanging out the window by his tippy toes and, and swinging about four feet over to the left. It doesn't work that way, and that was that. That was just to make the back shot. That wasn't the the headshot. The headshot came from the front, back to the left, ladies and gentlemen. 
to quote Kevin Costner as Jim Garrison, but back and to the left. All right, we're going to break. Top of the hour coming up. Stay tuned for hour number two. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in a few minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye from federaljack.com. It is November 26, 2012, and this is part two of my JFK assassination uh, special. Uh, As I said in the beginning of the first hour, it was inspired by the... Uh, emails, uh, comments, uh, messages, and phone calls that were left, uh, you know, just saying thank you so much for uh, the JFK, the 12 hours of stuff that we had played on the 22nd on Thanksgiving Day and for the show that I had done the night before about it. And I said, you know what, I still have a ton of stuff that I wasn't able to play, so why not get it out there for everybody? So hour number two is going to be jam-packed with stuff. And uh, I, I went off a little bit ranting in the first hour, so I have to kind of jam some of the audio here back to back. But I'll, I'm going to get as much in as I can because I literally have this huge playlist that I have <laughs> opened of different stuff I want to play. So back to the witnesses. Okay, I promised S.M. Holland's testimony. It's about 12 minutes, but again, this man's dead, and this is from 1966. Uh, S.M. Holland stood on top of the triple overpass with fellow witness Richard C. Dodd and James Leon Simmons, who you heard previously in the first hour. That's the man who the FBI, uh, they, they saw him and then the Warren Commission didn't even bother to call him to testify. And this is, uh, in the, this is a 1966 interview. So in the interview, uh, Holland's going to uh, tell Mark Lane about what he saw on that day and what you know what he saw going on after the assassination, and you're going to hear him say he's one of, again one of the guys that saw uh, a gunman by the grassy knoll. But I'll I'll let you hear it for yourself because uh, again this is S M Holland and uh, Mr Holland is long since passed away. So I'll let you hear it right from history, 1966, ladies and gentlemen, over 40 years ago. Mr Holland. On November 22nd, where were you? November the 22nd, I was standing on top of the triple underpass, waiting for the parade and the president's car. I arrived about uh, 11.45 or close to noon. Uh, two policemen was talking to me and asked me, one of them asked me if I would come back up there and identify the people that had any business or had a right to be up there. They would be a railroad employees? They'd be railroad employees, and I told him I would. And what, what was your position with the railroad company? I'm a track and signal supervisor for the Union Term Railroad. I've put in 41 years of railroad service in the signal park. Did you... Look in any particular direction when you heard the shots. Yes. I looked over to where I thought the shot came from. And I saw a puff of smoke still lingering underneath the trees in front of the wooden fence. The report sounded like it came from behind the wooden fence. And a policeman throwed his motorcycle down in the middle of the street and run up the embankment with his pistol drawn. He was running toward that particular spot. And also another pol- uh, motorcycle policeman right behind him tried to ride up the embankment on his motorcycle and it turned over about halfway up the embankment. And he got out, got off his motorcycle, and left it laying there and run on over to the fence with his gun in his hand. Where do you think the shots came from? Well, I know where that third shot came from. Where did that shot come from? Behind the picket fence. Is there any... Close to the little plaza. Is there any doubt in your mind that that shot came from behind the There's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind in the statement that I made to, in the sheriff's office immediately after the shooting and the statement that I made to the Warren Commission. And I made it very plain there was no doubt in my mind 
what there was definitely a shot fired from behind that picket fence. I made it plain to the Warren Commission, and I think I made the same statement in the sheriff's office. There was a fourth shot. On November 22nd, Mr. Holland, did you tell the sheriff's office in an affidavit you signed that day that you saw a puff of smoke come from behind the picket fence? I am certain I did. Was, was it the general feeling, would you say, Mr. Holland, among the police officers and others, at the moment that the shots were fired, that some, at least one shot came from behind that wooden fence? There's about six or eight of us boys from the Union Terminal run around there to find some evidence that there was someone around there. Certainly the ones that was with me that run around that fence. Uh, realize what was happening. They told me the same thing that I told you, that there was definitely a shot fired, and they saw the smoke. We just all started running around that fence as a unit. Is this the exact spot you were standing on on November 22nd, Mr. Holland? That's correct. This is the exact spot that I was standing on November the 22nd, waiting for the parade. And where did you hear that third shot come from? Right over about 20 or 30 feet from the other end of that little picket fence. And where was the smoke that you saw? It drifted right out underneath those green trees, those two trees. From behind the fence? From behind the fence. It kind of hung there just like a, for a few seconds, long enough that you could see that it was. And then what did you smoke? And then what did you do? Immediately after the president's car came underneath this overpass, a four of us broke a run around this fence to find out if we could see anybody leaving the air. Can we walk this way now? Do you want on the 22nd? Oh, we can walk that away right now. Fine. Right. Now they're walking towards the grassy knoll area. And they're actually literally walking right up to where he said he saw the puff of smoke come out, which is by the fence. We were trying to see what we could see, and... This was the direction you walked on the 22nd. This was the direction. We made this right turn. This steam line, this pipe, one man right behind me jumped and another one jumped right on top of him. Fell on top of him? Fell on top of him. Yeah, he's right at the picket fence. And they're walking through the yard. There were more cars here on the 22nd than there are today. Let me pause this for a second. They were bumper to bump. They're walking through the yard that Lee Bowers would have been overlooking from the railroad tower to, off to the left. And they're walking through the yard and the picket fences to their right. So he's literally walking Mark Lane over to where he saw the puff of smoke come from behind the picket fence. It's just a sea of cars. You couldn't hardly get through them. We were jumping over the bunkers, over the hood of the cars to work our way to the spot that we saw the smoke and heard the shot. And then we came up to the wooden fence. Mr. Holland, did you remain behind here for a while when the police officers were searching the area? Approximately 15 minutes before I had to go back to my office. There was about 40 or 50 people around here searching. And what did you find here? A lot of footprints behind this car, mud on the bumpers. And I looked around to see if I could find some empty shells or any evidence. Of and you've heard the the mud on the bumpers before from other testimony people, stuff I played last Wednesday, and even things that uh, were said during the Men Who Killed Kennedy series that we aired Thanksgiving Day. 
and you, you heard him say mud on the bumpers. Well, that would indicate that to get a good shot over that fence, the shooter probably stood up on the back of the bumper and, you know, leaned forward onto the fence and then you braced himself halfway between the fence and the car. And that would have pushed the car down. And if it was close enough, especially if there were maybe two men on it, it would have been enough weight to push the bumper down to the ground, touching the ground, getting it muddy. And that would be evidence that there was someone standing on the bumper there looking over the grass, looking over the fence. Now, why would they be doing that? People said they saw a gunshot coming from there. This is all stuff that does need to be investigated. So when you hear a gunshot from the grassy knoll as a smart-ass remark, and someone says, oh, yeah, you're believing a second gunman, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> the, the, the idea that there was a gunman there comes from the eyewitness testimony itself. It's not some conspiracy theorist. It's from people like S.M. Holland here. A shot being fired and a bullet shell rejected from the gun. And this is where I saw the smoke from the third shot. Right drifting out around here? Just drifting out underneath these trees. And when that... And now they're standing on the overpass. Or, or, excuse me, they're standing, listen to me, they were standing on the overpass where he was when they, they, they walked over to where the fence is. Now they're standing behind the, the fence, looking over the fence at the, from the grassy knoll area uh, down onto Elm Street, and where, you, where Kennedy would have been cruising down with the motorcade. Shot hit the president as he passed by this lamppost. Did you see the effect of the shot upon the president? Well, it knocked him over to his left, down in the car. Away from here. Away from here. Hear what he just said? Knocked him over and to the left. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. But of course, uh, who was it? Uh, Ted? No. Uh, what's his, Donaldson or whatever the hell his name was. The one that, he's dead now. I forget, the, I can't remember his name right now. One of the news guys came on and he was like, back and to the left does not mean that it was a shot from the front. Really? About where was he in relation, where was the car, the presidential limousine, in relation to the lamppost? Uh, just a little to the left of that lamppost we're looking at. In effect, Mr. Holland, the Warren Commission published just a very small portion of your testimony and used your testimony as proof that no shots could have come from behind the fence. Did they accurately and fairly use your testimony? They are wrong, because my testimony, and I made it very clear, that there was a fourth shot fired, and one of those shots came from behind that picket fence. And there's no doubt in my mind, I never will be, because I was on the spot. I saw the smoke, heard the report, and saw the smoke from behind that fence. And I don't see how that they could doubt they was a fourth shot fired. The vast majority of the witnesses who expressed an opinion as to the origin of the shots agreed with Mr. Holland that the shot did come from behind the fence. These witnesses, as this picture shows, were positioned throughout Dealey Plaza. The commission concluded that no credible evidence suggests that the shots were fired from any place other than the Texas School Book Depository building. Mr. Holland, you were on the overpass. You were probably in the best position of any witness on November 22nd. In your view, did the Warren Commission present all of the facts regarding the assassination of President Kennedy? Well, let me say this. Uh, the Warren Commission... I think, had to report in their book what they wanted the world to believe when they read the Warren Commission. As you know, as well as I know, that uh, everybody in the world was reading this Warren Commission and it had to read like they wanted it to read. 
They had to prove that Oswald did it alone. The commission also stated, as you know, Mr. Holland, that the same bullet which hit Governor Connolly first struck President Kennedy. Based upon what you observed from that position just above the street on the overpass, is that possible? No. No, that Warren Commission, that commission is in error on that. Because I was an eyewitness to that. And I know that the same bullet that hit President Kennedy did not hit Governor Connolly. The first bullet, the president slumped over, and Governor Connolly made his turn to the right and then back to the left. And that's when the second shot was fired and knocked him down in the floorboard. And it would have been impossible for him to turn had the bullet hit, the same bullet hit him that went through the president's neck. And did you see the, see the effect of the next bullet which struck President Kennedy? I saw the effects of the next bullet which struck the president. Because it flipped him over almost on his stomach and the side of his head. And his head was laying on the edge of the seat. He was laying more on his stomach. And his foot was hanging out of the, over the car, edge of the car, upside down. Yeah, and what's powerful enough to do that? What, what's powerful enough to do that? To flip him in that direction. A shot from behind or a shot from the front. Anybody that's ever, you know, even shot a, a, a target can tell you that uh, either which, which way the force from the bullet would cause the person to go. You're going to tell me your, your head is going to go back from being shot from behind? Really? That's how it works? Let's see what Dr. Cheryl Wecht says about the single bullet theory. Let's see what he has to say. Remember, the single bullet theory comes from Arlen Specter, who just recently passed away. Senator Arlen Specter, yes, him, the very one and the same. And the back wounds, the wounds to Kennedy's back, were altered to fit with the government's official theory by none other than Gerald Ford. That's right, Gerald Porn King Ford, ladies and gentlemen. The infamous magic bullet. We have that bullet exiting from President Kennedy's neck, moving forward and leftward and downward. It now stops in midair. It turns to the right. It comes back a full 18 inches, stops again, and then slams into John Connolly's back. It continues downward, and it goes through his wrist, and somehow they get that right wrist over to the left thigh. If you look at the Zapruder film, you'll see in the individual frames that John Connolly's right wrist is not near John Connolly's left thigh. The significance of this, the importance, cannot be exaggerated. It is impossible to overstate it. Why? Because the single bullet theory is the sine qua non of the Warren Commission report. It's not a matter of how much weight and credibility do you give to it. It's a matter of whether or not you have a single bullet theory that permits you to conclude that there was only one person firing, whether it was Oswald or anybody else in the world. If you don't have a single bullet theory, then you cannot have a sole assassin. And if you move to that point, then you're into conspiracy by definition. And that's why it had to stop with Oswald as a sole assassin. And that's why they came up with a single bullet theory. There's no question in my mind that that 26-volume set should be taken from the shelves of all the libraries where they now rest in the United States from nonfiction and placed in the fiction shelves along with Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and Gulliver's Travels. That's where they belong. And you wonder why they tried to destroy. Well, they did. They went after Dr. Cheryl Weck because this guy just crapped all over the Warren Commission report. And he is a... I got to give him credit. He's stuck by his story. Even though his these people turned his life upside down and went after him, the powers that shouldn't be. You know, they went after him.
career wise and stuff. He still st- stood fast to his story, never backed down. So kudos to you, Dr. Cheryl Wecht. And he's right. If, uh, as I said in the beginning of the broadcast, if you change any bit of this story, the slightest bit of the government's official version of the Kennedy assassination, it by definition becomes a conspiracy because two or more people were involved. So you can't even have somebody buying Lee Oswald a tank of gas. Can't. Because if they, if they, if they gave him money to finance him in any way, shape, or form, they could be connected to a quote-unquote conspiracy. So every lead had to be shot down. Every witness had to be either not called or if they were somebody that was called and they wouldn't change their story, threatened or killed. Look at Lee Bowers. Again, they found him dead. Um, and it was uh, like uh, the testimony I played uh, Mark, uh, the, from Mark Lane when he, uh, he interviewed him. Three months after that interview, Bowers was dead in a single car accident. And he was missing a finger. So in, be- after, in between them finding him dead... You know, in this car accident, in that interview that you heard of him earlier, he was uh, absconded with for a day by somebody, right? They took him, and they took his, they, they took a finger, maybe as a warning, to shut your mouth. And who knows? I mean, uh, they obviously feared what he had to say because his testimony destroyed the official story, right? It crapped all over it, so... If you really think that he just died in a single car accident, his finger went missing by some accident. Mm. Coincidence that this guy happens to witness these people from the 14-foot tower across the yard there that day? I don't buy it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break. Stay tuned. More JFK evidence and information when we get back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Final segment of today's Monday edition, and uh, as I said, all night I've been doing the JFK assassination special part two, playing the other bits of audio that I had uh, queued up that I had wanted to try to fit in there, but I just literally didn't have enough time to get everything in, so I've been trying to get it in here in another two-hour broadcast, and I have a few more things. I got uh, got three more clips. I'm going to try to fit them all in here into the final segment, so the first is something that's called uh, the Milter tape. Uh, and I've talked about the assassination plot, that there were a couple different areas that they were going to kill him. Uh, even in Dallas, they had uh, three different areas they wanted to, they had uh, looked at taking them out. It was uh, Love Field, um, the Trademark, and in where they got him by uh, Dealey Plaza. Now, there were other threats other than so obviously you could see that you know they they pick a spot and they 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 have three or four different spots in that city that they plan on taking them out you know as backups right and then they have multiple cities too so as you could see it obviously had to be a conspiracy it wasn't Oswald so uh, in the Milter tape uh, this is from November 1963 November 9th 1963 okay before the assassination uh, my Miami police audio taped a conversation between one of their informants. Uh, a man named William Somerset, and a wealthy, quote-unquote, right-wing extremist named Joseph Adams Milter. In the tape, Milter reveals his knowledge of a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. It's, quote, in the working from a building with a high-powered rifle. Uh, You're going to hear... lead the the guys that... One of the detectives, I guess, who was at the time uh, covering it, uh, Everett Kay describes setting up the surveillance, and he discusses the contents of the tape and a few other things. But check this out. I, I, a lot of people don't know even that there were other plots to take him out in other areas. And again, Judith has talked about this. Judith said that there was a plot uh, to take him out uh, in Miami. There was one in Dallas, and I forget where the third one was. But uh, And she said that Lee uh, had told her that he had screwed up one of them, and there's evidence that points to that fact that Lee might have been somebody... I believe, if I remember correctly, the FBI got a tip off or whatever it was uh, in Miami, and it wrecked it or whatever. But uh, there is evidence that it might have been uh, Oswald that did that. So, here, check this out. Let me play this for you. This is the evidence on the Milter tape. Well, I don't know, Kansas coming here. I think on the 18th or something like that. I made some kind of speech. I think he was the 18th or the 19th. Yeah, I think it was the 18th. Yeah, that's what it was about. Well, we had a 
had to set up the tape recorder in Somerset's apartment in order to uh, to make the recording where he met with, uh, with this other uh, man, uh, Milter. In order to do so, uh, it was a very large tape recorder that was made especially for uh, intelligence work, weighing approximately 40 pounds. I carried it to the third floor of his apartment, uh, placed it in a closet, and then ran the microphone around the baseboard in the kitchen, and the microphone was uh, hidden by, by the chairs where the military and uh, Somerset were to have their meeting. He just said the more bodyguards he has, the easier it is to get him. He just said, are they really going to try to kill him? And he said, oh, yeah, it's in the working. I mean, get this chance. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's going to be a hard process, I believe. Now, you may have it figured out to get it. You may have three ideas from all the buildings that, but I don't know how them secret service, they never cover all the office buildings, uh, and then where he's going. Do you know whether they do that or not? Well, if they have any suspicion, they would, of course. But that suspicion is not right away. And he just asked them if you couldn't make it out. He said, aren't they supposed to cover all the office buildings? What do you remember me playing from Colonel Fletcher Prouty? And he said, if there was proper secret service protection of the president, they would have come down here and they would have checked out all those buildings. That's standard operating procedure. And this guy's saying, well, without suspicion, the chances are they wouldn't. Mm. Without suspicion, that's their job. So why wouldn't they do it? Hmm. More evidence that they stood down. telling him you wouldn't take a gun up there, you'd take it up there in pieces, meaning into wherever elevated position, i.e. the sniper's nest in the sixth floor of the book depository. Uh, astoundingly, the conversation came up that this man wanted to know how many people that President Kennedy had that was his lookalike that went with him. And our informant wanted to know why, and he said, well, there was plans to assassinate him. The further conversation on the tape revealed that um, the assassination was to take place uh, from an office building with a high-powered rifle. There is no particular city mentioned, uh, or was there any particular person mentioned that was to do the assassination. The tape was made on uh, November the 9th, and John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, was due in Miami on the 18th of November, 1963. So the close proximity of the tape being made and his visit uh, made quite a few changes in the security. They changed the motorcade, and uh, I believe that he was helicoptered, and rather than have a motorcade, uh, additional men were um, secured. Uh, uh, everyone was made aware that, uh, that, that uh, there may be a problem, so there was a drastic change in the procedures. He wasn't as accessible in this city as he might have been in the past. We thought we did a good job and was very grateful the fact it did not happen in Miami. It could have very well happened in, in Miami. Um, 
as it did in Dallas. So it, it touched it touched each of us uh, very very closely, particularly myself, as hearing the words that they were going to assassinate President Kennedy. Oh, yeah, it's in the working. And uh, it says the Secret Service PRS sent copies of the military threat to field offices in Atlanta, Philadelphia, Indianapolis, Nashville, Washington, and Miami. Now, a lot of people don't even know that there was more than one threat. They just, obviously, if there was, uh, then. You know what? What does that tell you? If there was another threat in another city, then obviously it wasn't some lone crazy gunman that was pissed off and wanted to kill him. And of course, the the evidence of this stuff has been buried and everything else. It doesn't surprise me one bit. It shouldn't surprise you either, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, two other pieces of audio I want to play. There's a big bone of contention. Okay, uh, when it comes to the JFK assassination, and that is that. One of the reasons that he was killed was he was going to pull out of the Vietnam War. And a lot of people don't know that the Vietnam War, actually the first person killed, the first American killed in Vietnam in the Vietnam War was in 1945. If you don't believe me, go look it up. But uh, And the North Vietnamese were using weapons, old uh, World War II era weapons that were um, American weapons against our own soldiers. Go look that up too. Anyway, uh, the... Assassination Records and Review Board uh, have documents uh, that prove that JFK's Vietnam pullout was real. And uh, I have, that. there's a little tidbit of audio, and you're going to hear, in the beginning, you're going to hear this piece, uh, part of the interview, and you're going to hear Donald Sutherland and Kevin Costner talking. It's part of the, uh, the little interview between these two from the movie JFK, where they, they met in Washington. Well, Donald Sutherland's character is Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, who I've played the audio here before. So, you know, see how it all dovetails together? All right. Let's listen to what they have to say. Because they, there's a lot of people that say, no, Kennedy wasn't going to pull us out of Vietnam. There's no way. Blah, blah, blah. That's conspiracy theory. Well, here. Here's some information. Tuesday, the 26th of November, the day after they buried Kennedy. Gentlemen, I want you to know I'm not going to let Vietnam go like China did. I'm personally committed. Lyndon Johnson signs National Security Memo 273, which essentially reverses Kennedy's new withdrawal policy and gives a green light to covert action against North Vietnam, which provoked the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Just get me elected. I'll give you a damn war. When Oliver Stone and Zachary Sklar wrote the script for the film JFK. They integrated into the film a large amount of material on Kennedy's attempt to withdraw from Vietnam during the period 1963 to 1965. Much of this material came through the mouth of Donald Sutherland as he portrayed Mr. X, who Stone later said was modeled on former Air Force Colonel Fletcher Prouty. Prouty presented an abundance of material demonstrating that many months before the assassination, Kennedy had decided that the war was lost, that the intelligence community was deceiving him about what was really happening on the battlefield, and that the United States had to withdraw. The political problem was that Kennedy had to cloud that fact with reports that the war was going well enough to be turned over to the government of South Vietnam. And the complete withdrawal had to be after the 1964 election to ensure that he would not be attacked for losing Vietnam, which is what would have happened if an immediate and complete withdrawal would have taken place. Stone and Sklar were attacked by pundits from both the left and the right on this issue. The review board has now classified some new records on this issue, and all these records substantiate what Stone and Sklar had put into the film. In May of 1963, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara had a meeting in Hawaii with approximately 60 other members of the team involved in supervising the war in Vietnam. This was called the Sec Death Conference. McNamara had several of these to be briefed by as many people as possible on the ground in Vietnam as to how that war was going. This was the last meeting. In the record of that meeting, item two, comprehensive plan, Republic of Vietnam, subhead D, plan to withdraw 1,000 U.S. military personnel from Republic of Vietnam by December 
of 1963. In a long memo labeled Top Secret, there's another record. It reads, the program currently in progress to train Vietnamese forces will be reviewed and accelerated as necessary to ensure that all essential functions visualized to be required for the projected operational environment to include those now performed by U.S. military units and personnel can be assumed properly by the Vietnamese by the end of calendar year 1965. All planning will be directed towards preparing Republic of Vietnam forces for the withdrawal of all U.S. special assistant units and personnel by the end of calendar year 1965. Now what's interesting about this next document is that it's in December of 1963, December the 2nd. And this is of course just about nine or ten days after President Kennedy is dead. This concerns Mr. McNamara getting reports from the Joint Chiefs and from Major General Krulak on the situation in South Vietnam. It reads, the Secretary also requested that he be informed at each Monday meeting as to what has been done during the previous week to advance action against North Vietnam. The Secretary indicated that he believed that there was an urgent need for the development of a plan to place increasing pressure on North Vietnam. So in other words, from the accelerated decrease in forces and the withdrawal under President Kennedy, in just a matter of over a week, Secretary of Defense McNamara is talking about more action against Vietnam. What is being done in the development of a plan to place pressure on North Vietnam? What these documents do to most readers is reinforce the thesis of JFK. In other words, that Kennedy's intent to withdraw from Vietnam was reversed after the assassination. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. And since I have a few minutes left, I have to jam the last section of audio in. This is retired FBI agent Don Adams, who actually, um, a little bit jealous, Joe Joseph had the honor of interviewing him a few years ago. Unfortunately, uh, Don Adams is no longer with us. He's passed away. But he was uh, an FBI agent all the way back uh, in the 60s. And uh, coming, uh, coming back up through uh, in, into now, uh, over the years, Don always said that, uh, as he researched more into it, that the Kennedy assassination was a conspiracy. And, uh, you know, it, it will always be a conspiracy. It's not some fantasy and everything else. And he did put out a lot of good information out there. And uh, he, he has passed. I would have liked to have picked his brain myself. Uh, that's why I've been trying to get on as many uh, people that are still around that can remember the Kennedy assassination. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this event was 49 years ago already. When I was a kid, I remember the Kennedy assassination being like, oh, that was only like 13 years ago, 14 years ago. And I remember talking to my mom about it when I was maybe six or seven, and it was fresh. It, ha it, was, you know, it was like the distance if a, if a child was born uh, around now to 9-11 and they talked to you know, their parents and they, or they were like four or five now and they came up to their parents and said, hey, you know, 9-11, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda, Bin Laden, the same thing with the Kennedy assassination was for me. It was still very fresh. And now uh, I'm older and I, I still research this and a lot of the people that uh, were involved and a lot of the people, the, the witnesses and stuff are dying off. That's why it's really important to, to cover this. And that's why I wanted to dedicate another two hours to it, especially considering... Uh, it it kind of got swept under the rug this year. So here we go. Let's hear from uh, FBI former FBI agent Don Adams. And by the way, uh, this piece, uh, the narrator might be a little snide because this is a piece from a, a local news media clip that uh, the local news media interviewed him. But let's let's hear what he has to say. This guy's an ex FBI agent saying that it was a, it was a, a conspiracy. It wasn't just uh, the assassination was a, a, a bigger conspiracy. It wasn't just a lone gunman. Well, obviously, he's not some crazy kooky conspiracy theorist, right? Did Lee Harvey Oswald kill President John F. Kennedy? No. Had nothing to do with it. Former FBI agent Don Adams from Summit County says thousands of National Archives prove... The Warren Commission was, was nothing but a bunch of liars. The Korean War veteran entered the FBI September 1962. He was assigned to Thomasville, Georgia, where he began investigating a man named Joseph Adams Miltier. He was reported to be one of the most violent men in the country. A friend of Miltier's... Who 
Miltier was the guy you just heard talking on the tape uh, from Miami that I played. The Miltier tape. That's the same guy. William Somerset, who was also an FBI informant, said Miltier was threatening JFK. And Somerset was telling them that he was really radical and he was saying bad things about what they wanted to do to Kennedy. Agent Adams completed the Miltier investigation and a week later, shots rang out in Dallas. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. It, it devastated me and I thought to myself, what did I do wrong? His boss said, find Miltier. I said goodbye to my partner. He never said a word to me about anything about Miltier that he knew him or anything. Many years later, Don learned that agents contacted his partner, who told them Miltier was in Georgia, essentially eliminating him as a suspect. And that shocked me when I saw that document because I knew it was an outright lie. Then, when Adams finally captured Miltier days later, he says his supervisor prohibited him from conducting a proper interrogation. Miltier was released, and Agent Adams transferred. And where did I go but to Dallas, Texas? He remembers seeing the Zabruder film for the very first time. And all of a sudden, I saw the president go like this with his hands. And I said, Hal, I said, he was shot, he was shot in the throat. The minute that you... He's referring to when Kennedy grasped towards his throat. If you've ever seen the Zapruder film, he grabs the front of his throat. That proves that there was a shot, another shot from the front that came through the windshield, which if you listened to uh, the one segment of audio from The Men Who Killed Kennedy Part 7, The Smoking Guns, it talks about a bullet hole being in the windshield. Witnesses seeing a bullet hole through the windshield going, coming from the outside, the front of the windshield, through to the inside of the windshield. To have a frontal shot, Oswald can't be the shooter because this came from a grassy knoll. And Oswald was in Texas School Book Depository. The Warren Commission said three shots were fired, but Don counted 11. Uh, the agent said to me, Don, uh, be careful what you say and how you say it, because the Warren Commission is here and they've already ruled that Oswald is the shooter and there were no shots from the front. The Army veteran wondered how Oswald fired three shots in seven and a half seconds from a bolt action rifle. I'm going to tell you something right now, guys. There's no way in the world Oswald shot that weapon. And boy, I mean, I was really cautioned then. Don eventually retired from the FBI, never thinking twice about Miltier, until 1992, when he saw a picture in this book, which he says positively places Miltier in Dallas the day of the shooting. Joseph Adams Miltier looking at the presidential car moments before the president was killed. At the National Archives and Records Administration, Don found many reports missing or manipulated, including his file on Miltier from 63. Everything that I had done was gone. Everything was gone. But the most startling discovery was a tape recording captured by Miami intelligence officers November 9th, 1963, just weeks before Dallas. Miltier is talking to the informant, William Somerset. The FBI headquarters and Secret Service both had that tape within days. I should have stopped the president from traveling yesterday. But well, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. There you go. See how it all dovetails together? I guess we're not crazy conspiracy theorists after all. We're conspiracy factualists. Truth is definitely stranger than history. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Love you all. Special broadcast coming up Wednesday. Tune in. Till then, I'm out of here. <laughs>